Welcome. My name is Penelope Chatterton. Welcome to Awaken the Dream. My friends, I have a guest today. He's a new friend of mine. His name is Edmund Robinson. He is the minister at the Unitarian Universalist Church in Chatham. I got it all out. <laughs> and, and he's fun, and he gives great sermons, and he's a musician, he's been a lawyer. What haven't you done? <laughs> That's a long list. We don't have time for that. But you know, my friends, I was mentioning to you, want to know, how did you end up a Unitarian minister? Are you, you're not called reverends, are you? You just, what are you called? Pastor? Edmund. Uh, <laughs> But you're not pastor. I mean, I don't know. You what can be called a pastor. You can be called a minister. Um, a father is a little bit stretching it for <laughs> our, our particular yes. style. Yeah. Uh, but uh, people sometimes, my friends call me Rev sometimes. Ah, yeah. that's nice. Yeah, so um, I, uh, I answer to anything. Yes. It wasn't your first bent, though, when you decided to go into a career. No, or no. What was your, like, did your mother ever say to you, God, you'd make a great lawyer or you'd be a terrific musician or? Well, I haven't ever been a professional musician. I rarely have performed music for money, occasionally, but I don't consider myself they a professional. I pass It's simply <laughs> a amateur in the best sense of the word, a, a lover of music. I, my enthusiasm for music far outstrips my talent. All right. Um, so That's half the battle. That's right. Um, but I do have a, a strong enthusiasm for it because music speaks to me in a very deep place. Yeah. Um, but I didn't set out to be a minister. I really didn't set out to be a lawyer, but my father was a lawyer. Uh -huh. And he has an older brother <coughs> who is a theologian. And two of my first cousins were theologians. So that was two uh -huh. of the career paths that was sort of set out in my family uh -huh. uh, for me. And I chose the one and then jumped to the other. <laughs> Did you find it just didn't feel right? Uh, no, I didn't find that the law practice didn't feel right. It was uh, actually very fulfilling for me. I just decided there was something more I could be doing with my life. Yeah. Uh, I had, uh, I grew up in the 60s uh, and came of age in the protests against uh, uh, racial segregation and the Vietnam War. Yeah. Uh, went off to college. I became somehow a liberal in a very conservative <laughs> southern environment. <coughs> my uh, family law firm founded by my grandfather was on the wrong side of almost every civil rights uh, case from the mid 50s to the uh, <laughs> oh, mid 70s, uh, defending the Southern way of life. Oh dear. Uh, and I was uh, not particularly happy with that. And I sort of went on the other side of things, out on the barricades during my college years. And uh, in the process, I drifted away from the Episcopal faith of my childhood. Oh, you were raised Episcopal. Uh, my family is Episcopalian for 14 uh, generations. Oh my gosh. In South Carolina, yes, Ooh. that's right. So, lots to look at. Lots to look at. Um, and I th took a lot of courses in religion, uh, world religions and comparative religions when I was in college. And I um, pretty much was n could not say the Nicene Creed by the time I uh, was 18 years old without crossing my fingers behind my back. <laughs> I nevertheless got married uh, because I, my high school, I was marrying my high school sweetheart, my first wife, uh, and uh, we were both from the same Episcopal church. We knew each other from the same Episcopal church we'd grown up in, so oh. there was no place to get married but that church. Gotcha. Uh, and, uh, but that was the last time I was uh, really formally involved in the Episcopal church. Um, and came back, went to, uh, knocked around, looked at several different careers. This is the early 70s, when okay. we were convinced that the revolution was going to happen very soon. Ah. And we wanted to be in the right place for it to happen. Gotcha. Uh, one of the things that I tried was um, selling encyclopedias. Ah. Um, door to door? Uh, yeah, I, I went and got a, uh, little tear-off thing from the bookstore. I was in Ann Arbor, Michigan at the time. And um, we got these leads, and I would go try to sell people encyclopedias. Uh. The first people that I tried to do was um, an undergraduate there at the University of Michigan family, a married undergraduate, who uh, had changed from political science to religion because he had discovered Jesus. And he and his wife were going to go out and 
go to God commune in, in those days. That oh. probably doesn't make any sense today, but that, that was what people a were God doing. Commune. Was back to the land, but back to Jesus. Okay. Uh, so my task in selling them encyclopedias was to convince them that in addition to truth, they needed information. Um, <laughs> I didn't make that sale for two hours. I didn't make the sale. I'm sure I Jesus was in there somewhere. The rest, of the, the rest of the week went like that. And then I tried gardening, and I tried uh, security guard, and I tried various other things. And finally, I saw this thing in the New York Times that the new law school, new radical law school was opening in Washington, D.C., being mm. planned. And I said to my wife, let's try that. Um, I knew what being a lawyer was about, uh, because my father was a lawyer, and I knew I didn't want to do the kind of law that he practiced, but I thought maybe you could make a difference in the, the world, change the world, uh, within the confines of practicing law. Sure. So it, if it was possible, that this was going to be the school that would set you up to do it. So we applied and we were admitted in the first class of the Antioch School of Law in Washington, D.C. And September found us in this office building in downtown D.C., so temporary quarters that made all these packing boxes and everything that the, the, the first year class was all lined up, oh, ready dear. to go. Uh, and we didn't know what was going on. There were people that were older than us, people that were slightly younger than us, a lot of movement people, uh, uh, left-wing uh, activists. And as we were sitting there wondering uh, what was going to become of us, I hear this voice from three people back in the line, look, Dick, there's a guy that so tried to sell us encyclopedias in Ann Arbor. <laughs> no, yeah. you're kidding. <laughs> oh, my God. So that was sort of a sign uh, yes. that I don't know exactly what it was a sign of. <laughs> well, it I think a, it's a message. It, um, it was a sign that, that um, I don't know, that what you do is somewhat a product of choice and somewhat a product of circumstance. And I think I've uh, alluded to that several times in recent sermons. But uh, I was carried into the practice of law, and uh, I did uh, enjoy it. Uh, I thought I did well for my clients for 20 years. That's a long time. But at some point, I was sitting, and I became a Unitarian Universalist. I found um, I was sitting outside uh, the Unitarian Church in Charleston, which is where we ended up. We came to Charleston instead of Columbia because uh, Columbia would be too close to my conservative family. Um, uh -huh. So we, we wanted to be in a place where we could make our own way. Yeah. So we went to Charleston, and the, the place that we lived in was right across the street from the Unitarian Church in Charleston, which is the oldest Unitarian Church in the South. Ah. And, um, somebody's heard me playing the auto harp in my courtyard and said, that's very pretty. Would you come play for us next week in the church? Oh, get so out. So I walked across the street and I... Didn't uh, have far to go. Went, went in and looked around and said, saw organ pipes and stained glass windows and hymnals. And I says, this is, look, looks like a church. Uh, what do you have to believe to belong here? <laughs> and they said, uh, this church does not have any creed. This church uh, allows people of any theological orientation to attend. Hmm. I thought I had died and gone to heaven. I bet you I did. I loved the, the <laughs> churchiness of my Episcopal church background. So you had a little of that. But I had that without having to say the creed, besides which next door they had a uh, beautiful parish hall with a sprung wood floor just waiting for somebody to come in and call a contra dance on it. So I, um, I had died and gone to heaven. I was everything in that church for the next uh, 18 years. Wow. Oh. And when I got to a point in that church um, listening to a sermon uh, by a layperson in the congregation, Floyd Work, who had founded the first homeless shelter in town, and her topic was changing the world. Ah. And she says, uh, okay, I'm only going to speak for about five minutes here because I'm going to let you all speak the rest of this sermon because oh. I want you to stand up where you are and tell me how, what you're doing to change the world. Ooh. And I got up and I talked about the things I'd done with the ACLU and with my folk organization. And, but what I was mostly thinking about was, oh, yeah, changing the world. That's what it was supposed to be about back in the 60s. That's what we sort of, people in what we call the movement, yeah. uh, felt 
called to do. Um, and it is, wasn't that we had succeeded. You know, we had not eliminated racism. We had not eliminated homophobia or the corporate state or the in wealth inequalities. There was still much work to be done. And right. I started thinking at that point, what else could I be doing? What could I be doing to leverage what I want to do more uh, to change the world better or more? And that sort of blossomed. Uh, it took a couple of years. There's, uh, they talk about uh, St. Paul became St. Paul rather than Saul of Tarsus because he was on the road to Damascus and he saw a blinding light and said, why are you persecuting me? Um, yeah. I didn't have that quite, that experience, that blinding experience, but at some point I uh, was picked up my car phone on the way to court in North Charleston and I called the Unitarian Universalist Association and I called Harvard Divinity School and I said, please send me packets about what it would take for me to get into the ministry. Good and I had you. several counselors uh, that helped me on my way and uh, I eventually did go to Harvard Divinity School and I did become a UU minister. It took me <laughs> something like nine years to get out of the practice of law. Really? Yeah, because uh, I had my four years in divinity school, but then I also um, had a, my first ministry was part-time. So I was a lawyer part of the week and a minister part of the week Yeah. when I was uh, uh, ministering to the church in Wakefield. Yeah, but it was the creedless situation. That was what, that was what that, made me a Unitarian Universalist in the first place. That was not what brought me into the ministry. But, right. Uh, now, let's explain creeds to me. Are okay. they rules? Are they beliefs? Are they affirmations? Are they heartfelt? Uh, what are they? The president of the UUA, um, Peter Morales, recently had a, a little essay that he published uh, saying, belief is the enemy of faith. Now, oh. Think about that for I, a second. I don't Belief have to. I know exactly faith. what you mean. Uh, and I've just got a book called uh, The Religious Case Against Belief. <laughs> Belief should be contrasted, the, the, the New Testament emphasis on belief, and really it's from the Gospel of John that it comes, should be contrasted with the Jewish background of the Hebrew Bible. To be a good Jew did not require you to believe any particular thing. It requires you to be loyal to Yahweh and to observe the Jewish law. If you were a member of the covenant, and that meant if you were a male, you were circumcised, you were a member of the covenant, then the, that, that implied that you would live a certain way. Mm -hmm. You would observe certain prohibitions. But it did not require you to believe any particular thing about God because God is ultimately unknowable. Yes. God is the mystery. God is the question mark. God is the X yeah. beyond which there is no explanation. Yeah. But, and Elaine Pagels, who's this Christian theologian, uh, a New Testament scholar, has this wonderful book called Beyond Belief about the Gospel of Thomas. Yes. The Gospel of Thomas is this early text. Some scholars speculate that it may be earlier than the canonical Gospels. Uh, it may be the Q text that brought the Jewish church forward mm -hmm. from the time of the execution of Jesus until the time the Gospels were written in the year 70 or thereafter. That that came about, it's we finally have, from a discovery in 1945, we have a complete copy of that Gospel of Thomas text. Yeah. And it does not talk about belief. It requires you uh, to live a good life. And it also implies that we are all children of God, rather than Jesus being the sole children. When you say child of God or son of God, yeah. There are two different ways in which that can be taken, okay? If I believe that God is my heavenly Father, then I am a child of God, I'm a son of God. Yeah. You're a daughter of God. Yeah. Um, that's one way of doing it. The claim in the Gospel of John that Jesus was the unique 
divine Son of God is an entirely different claim of that an is entirely different so order. True. Okay, so the Gospel of Thomas made the former claim, and John, in Elaine Pagels's theory, was written to refute Thomas, because Thomas actually becomes a character in John's Gospel. John Thomas is the doubting Thomas. Yeah. When Jesus appears after his execution, after his resurrection to all these people, Thomas is the one that wants to put his fingers into the wound. Yep. Uh, so John makes Thomas into this sort of buffoon figure and says that belief is the pathway to heaven. So uh. most, Christ, most Orthodox Christians will cite John uh, 3.16 as the encapsulation of, uh, of Christianity, of the elevator speech of Christianity, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all that believe yeah. in, in him, him should not perish but have everlasting life. Yeah. Um, ever since then, and the, for 200 years they didn't know exactly what that belief consisted of because nobody had, uh, or people gave very different answers. And people wrote other texts. First, beginning with 180, uh, in the year 180, uh, Irenaeus wrote a book against the heretical text, which resulted in most of those heresies being wiped out, the text being wiped out, uh, burned and, okay. and destroyed. Yeah. Um, then, then when uh, Constantine threw in his lot with Christianity and made it the state religion of Rome, the first thing he had to do, being a logical Roman, we have to say what Christianity is. Okay. So he called this big council of Nicaea um, from the Latin-speaking uh -huh. bishops in the West, the Greek-speaking bishops in the East, all were to come together and decide what Christianity was. Well, there was a huge, <laughs> it took them four councils actually to, yeah. to formulate what we now call the Nicene, Nicene Creed. Nicene Creed. And, but that is all a statement of belief, credo, I believe. Yeah. Okay. You could, it's, it's our, I think, foundational belief that revelation is not sealed. Or as the UC, our UCC brothers have been saying, brothers and sisters, I should say, have been saying uh, in their ad campaigns lately, uh, God has not finished talking. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> the, the other thing that I find very uh, frustrating about the Nicene Creed, uh, the Apostles' Creed, is that it talks, it makes these theological propositions about Jesus, but doesn't talk about what Jesus taught. To me, yeah. the teachings of Jesus are the most important thing, and this has been uh, really reaffirmed by contemporary biblical scholarship. Yeah. Yep. The, the uh, Jesus Seminar throws out their black balls and their yellow balls and their red balls to say what likelihood they think any particular passage was um, really the words of the historical Jesus. Right. And the one that gets the most black balls yeah. is the Sermon on the Mount. Yeah. The Sermon on the Mount, which is nowhere mentioned in the Nicene Creed. You know, love your neighbor, do not return evil for evil. When someone hits you on the cheek, turn the other cheek. If someone uh, asks you to walk with them a mile, go the second mile. Yeah. All of those uh, things, to my mind, are the essence of what Jesus was here for. Ditto. And, uh, per beautifully said, Be and, perfect. And, uh, and, and completely ignored by, uh, born of a virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. Look at that, born, suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. Nothing about the life that yeah. took place between those yeah. two points. Yeah. But you know, I, from my studies, Jesus was heard by so few Mm -hmm. His message was almost too easy, too simple. It was just love your neighbor as yourself. It yeah. was just, and even some of the, uh, very few disciples kind of got that. And then of course, human beings get their hand on stuff. And before you know it, they've created something else. Mm -hmm. And he did. Well, I would agree with you in simple, maybe, but not easy. Oh, not easy. I'm so, I that's, think the hardest, he's, what he said is the hardest thing to live. It's to, easy to say, yeah, it's love really you, hard to live. That is so love true. Love is the most challenging thing that we have. Yeah. It's also the greatest force I know, in the world. I know, and hearing the voice and being guided yeah. the way Jesus was. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
on Awaken the Dream, we have folks who come here who know they have an avenue, they have a, a voice, they have a message, mm -hmm. and it, they are sons and daughters, and they have everything. So, um, we, some people think that Unitarians go back to Arianism, which is the losing side in the Nicene Creed battles. Oh. We don't really go back that far, um, because both sides there really counted Jesus as divine. By that time, Jesus, it, the only debate between the Arians and the Athanasians was whether Jesus had existed from all time along with God the Father, that part of the Godhead, or whether Jesus came in a little bit later yeah. and might have been created by God. Yeah. So Nicene Creed uh, resolves that by saying, begotten, not made. Yeah. Because uh, okay. yeah. there are two ways that things, something can come into being. Something can come into being by being birthed into the world or made like a sculpture uh, is made. Yeah. Anyway. Well, you found your niche. I'm hearing this. I mean, when yeah. you went into that church, something within you just said, this is a match. There was a match. This was a match. A match. Isn't uh, that wonderful? Yes. That's yes, very yes. wonderful. It's, uh, I'm uh, constantly grateful when I can remember to be grateful. Yeah. Let's put it this way. And yeah. what I'm constantly reminding myself is be grateful. Yeah. We have to tell our friends too where to find your church. We have your web address is being yeah. put up. UUMH.net. It used to be the old Christian Science Church right at that, whatever you call that V. Uh -huh. um, the only, the, this is the only real traffic light in there you go. Chatham. <laughs> uh, it's, it's at the corner, it's across from the Village Market, uh, and it's uh, the corner of Kroll Road, Main Street, which is Route yeah. 28, and Queen Anne Road. Yeah, that's Anne a Road. crazy little coming together there. Yeah. And your service is 10.30. 10.30 on Sunday mornings, yep. And we'll be, uh, I'll be preaching there the rest of December. Then I take a sabbatical. And then we you're have daring a to leave. We have a one, I tr I'm trusting my good congregation to take care of it without me. We have a substitute minister who'll be in for, I think, three Sundays a month uh, named Paul Sprecher uh -huh. coming down from uh, Situate. Oh, really? So okay. It'll be very interesting. And I'm uh, looking forward to having my congregants hear somebody besides me. Ah, sure. Well, you all take good care of each other. I, we try to. I really feel a, a lot of warmth and friendliness and concern and just a great support group. We have a congregation at this point which is um, fairly, fairly heavily on the retirees side. Uh, yeah. And a lot of our, what we do in showing our love is uh, call each other up and make sure we're yeah. greeting the day. All right, we've got our five minute signal. So we've now, okay. we've been teasing you about all these, mus all these instruments you play. You're gonna do a tune for us. I was gonna do you a little song, not by you, you, <laughs> but a song which I think expresses uh, what we're about. Uh, where did that month time go? Please. I know, I warned you. This is by a, a guy named uh, David Tamalevich. It's called uh, Ours is a Simple Faith. Uh -huh. Ours is a simple faith. Love is a, life is a short embrace. Heaven is in this place every day. Hope is the ground we till. Make each day what you will. Thankful for dreams fulfilled every day. There is no hell to fear. No judgment day drawing near. Trust that inner voice you hear every day. Um, life is a mister. No, life's not a goal or race. It's about heart and faith, living a life of grace every day. Hope, let's see. Um, the, uh, uh, my mind, mind just went blank. That's let's all see. right. It'll Ours come. is a simple faith. Love is a sh life. Ours is a simple faith. Life is a short embrace. Heaven is in this place every day. Hope is the ground we till. Make each day what you will. Thankful for dreams fulfilled every day. Oh, that's great. And it is exactly, it fits. Mm -hmm. It says it all. 
It oh, says a lot. Thank you for doing that. Uh, what else do you pleasure. play besides whatever that was? <laughs> That's a concertina. That's called an Anglo concertina, and uh, I play that, and I play fiddle, and I play banjo. Oh, do you go out and play with a band? We have a house band at the uh, meeting house. It's called the All Worn Out Jug Band. <laughs> <laughs> we play old jug band stuff, and we have a great time. Oh, that's great. great. We, we will be playing in the meeting house at uh, first night, uh, midnight on, well, we, uh, 7 o'clock and 8 o'clock on New Year's Eve. Fantastic. So we get go out and get yourself a first night badge, mm -hmm. and uh, you can come see us and hear my wife at 5 o'clock. Oh, Jacqueline, a fine yes. pianist. Yes, yes, yes. yes what a right. talented couple. What a yeah. great couple. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I'm really lucky to have found such a soulmate. Yeah, we have two minutes to go, but I just want to thank you for your talking about Creedless uh -huh. because I, I just learned a lot. Uh -huh. And I like what you said. It's funny, my oldest son shot me through email years ago, the, the Thomas, uh -huh. the Gospel of Thomas, because yeah. for some reason, I think as it surfaced, people were really looking at that, and it just has changed lives. Yeah. And it, it, as you say, it's simple and challenging. Yes. Well, Thomas is very mysterious. It's a, it's a, it, Thomas has lots of depth in it, but it, you can puzzle over what the meaning of those things forever and ever. It's good a good koan, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the uh, Zen Buddhist word koan. It's yes. something that challenges your mind to wrap it around. I recommend uh, the Gospel of Thomas as a koan. A koan, okay, yeah. all right. So you've been with um, the Chatham Church how long? Five years. That's not long. That's not long. No, and you plan to stay, I hope. The Chatham Church is one of the younger churches, uh, uh, UU churches in the country. Um, and um, we hope to be around for some time to come. I'm sure you will. Yeah. You have a very strong congregation, I can just tell. Great music program if people want to come and sing. They have a, a wonderful, we're, we're always looking for singers in the choir, particularly tenors. Did you hear that, friends? <laughs> Why are tenors, tenors are always needed everywhere. I know, I know, and some of the, uh, some of the best tenors are women, you know. That's right. That's right. That's right. Well, I can't thank you enough for coming on our show. And on our next program, we're thank going to you. talk to friends about um, other churches on the Cape. Right. And you can explain that to us. Right. So I want to thank you very much for joining us. And okay. I'm going to check out. So thank you very much, friends, for joining us on Awaken the Dream. And we will talk to you again soon.